Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome. I'm Leela Fernandez, the director of the Jackson School of International Studies. Um, I would like to begin today's event by situating the, the Jackson School. The Jackson School acknowledges that we are on Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, Sequamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other, and other indigenous peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and indigenous peoples across the world. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to today's um, um, uh, event. This is the last event in our spring 2021 lecture series, Changing Global Connections, New Formations of Identity, Place, and Region. Um, the series has been co-sponsored by the Center for Global Studies. And this event is additionally co uh, sp sponsored by the Center for Western European Studies and the Ellison Center for Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies in the Jackson School at the University of Washington. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Lohman, who, um, who has um, played an instrumental role in organizing this panel, How Emerging Tech is Changing International Security. Dr. Sarah Lohman is an acting assistant professor in the Henry M. Jackson School for International Studies and a visiting professor at the US Army War College. Her teaching and research focus is on cyber and energy security and NATO policy. And she's currently a co-lead for a NATO project, which we will hear more about today, on energy security in an era of hybrid warfare. She joins us, she joins us today from Germany, where she has taught political science and cybersecurity for much of the last decade. Previously, Dr. Lohman was a press spoke spokeswoman for the US Department of State for Human Rights, as well as for the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Before her government service, she was a journalist and Fulbright scholar. She has been published in multiple books, including a handbook on di digital transformation called Redesigning Organizations, Concepts for the Connected Society, which, which was published in Springer in 2020. And she's written over a thousand articles in international press outlets. Sarah, I'm delighted to have you here today and, and also as part of the Jackson School, welcome. Thank you, Leela. It is such a great pleasure to be part of the Jackson School faculty and to also be here with my colleagues from the NATO Science and Technology Project today. I want to welcome Vitas Boutramas um, from Lithuania, from the Energy Security NATO Center of Excellence, as well as Christina Livy, the Chief Science Officer from Hypergiant, um, which is actually the AI startup number one in America last year. I'm also honored to be on this panel with my esteemed colleague, um, Ambassador Koenig, the former ambassador to Cyprus and deputy permanent representative to the US mission at NATO. We are teaching a class together, uh, which consists of students from both the University of Washington as well as the US Army War College fellows. So very excited to be doing that. I'm going to share my screen here um, as we get into what we're looking at with emerging technology. So um, I want to start by providing an overview of top emerging technologies. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, there we go. Um, to provide an overview of top emerging technologies making an impact on international security. Um, then I'm gonna turn to Vitas to talk more in depth about cybersecurity and critical infrastructure. And I'm really glad that Vitas um, is here because we have a subject matter expert who can help us, for example, uh, later analyze what happened with the colonial pipeline attack last weekend and give us a few takeaways for international security today. Um, that will be followed by Christina, who will help us uh, do a deep dive into AI and how this is changing international security. The next part is the fun part, all of your questions. So Ambassador Koenig will be collecting them to make sure, um, please go ahead and use that Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen um, and send him all of your burning questions. We'll be looking forward to those. So how are new technologies shaping the face of international security around the world? Uh, the availability of new innovation through the cybersphere is opening us up to new opportunities, but it's also opening us up to new threats. That's because the world is more connected than ever before. Um, so basically I wanna give an overview today of what emerging technology is doing around the world to help international security and to challenge it. I'll talk about three emerging tech areas. First of all, the internet of things, which we call IOT. 
um, 5G or the fifth generation of cellular technology and big data tools. In the last few days, we've seen how cyber attacks have had a massive impact on international security. When we think about the hacking of the colonial pipeline on the US East Coast last weekend. Several weeks ago, there was also a cyber attack on Iran's Nantes nuclear facility. And these attacks, um, basically they do not take place in a void. They can cause ripple effects globally um, or serve as a response to an international security threat. They can send a warning or they can heighten tensions between nations. They could prevent escalation or buy time for more diplomacy. They can also drive up oil prices, affect the stock market and cause global insecurity. So the world is increasingly reliant on different forms of emerging technology, but today's citizens are using it in a way that leaves them often defenseless. So um, let's talk a few minutes for a few minutes about what I really mean by that. I want to look at these specific uh, tools of emerging technology. All right, let's talk first of all about uh, IoT and the smart grid. We've seen smart grids all across uh, Asia, Europe, and even the United States. And, and in this case, they allow electricity networks to connect generators with consumers. They basically use computerized two-way communications to respond to local electricity needs faster and more efficiently. It's the next generation of what we previously knew as the electric grid, which connects every person and every business and infrastructure in the city. So it's totally connecting all of these elements. It ensures that the lights don't go out even in bad weather or when there are worker shortages. The Internet of Things basically enables today's smart grid through wireless devices like sensors and gateways and routers. But uh, because the cyber system is integrated with the physical power system, once its control centers are penetrated through cyber intrusions, critical infrastructure like electricity or heat, water and aviation have been impacted, affecting thousands in the civilian population. So, are we about to get rid of the smart grid? No, obviously not. Our security though has to be more proactive and more future proof. The use of digital technology to regulate data flows and information management in the smart grids make them cost efficient and more reliable. But that same innovation that improves efficiency in the energy industry also makes it the most attractive target. In fact, energy sector industrial control systems are the most attacked infrastructure. The Department of Homeland Security has actually told us that there are continued targeted malicious cyber activities aimed at the US power grid. There, there've been intrusions into the control rooms of power stations and networks that were supposed to be impenetrable, and they've gained critical new information on how the industrial control systems are run. Unfortunately, this malicious activity has not just impacted the US. We've seen similar attacks in the Ukraine, as many of you know, um, where the grid was successfully hacked. Um, here in Germany, where I sit, the Interior Ministry reported last year um, and, and in previous years that they had been similarly targeted. Um, and there was a widespread and systematic uh, attack against Germany's energy networks, basically um, affecting electricity and natural gas. So now Europeans are facing a dilemma as they uh, start switching over to 5G, which is the fifth generation of cellular networks. Um, because 5G can improve the efficiency of grid networks or water distribution through the use of Internet of Things, how and who builds the infrastructure does matter. So is this emerging technology actually making the world less secure? Is international security necessarily being challenged by the strides we're taking in technology? It's not the tech itself. It's what we're doing to secure or not secure that technology that matters. IoT can actually strengthen democracy or it can open doors for malicious actors to step through. Let's take what's going on in India. India's electronic voting machines make voting more precise and efficient in areas where women or the elderly 
or previously some castes could not allow their voices to be heard. That technology enables an instant record of a vote and it empowers democracy in places where voter fraud had previously been going on due to ballot stuffing. If we take this a step further, new IoT-based advanced voting machines are not just enabling this process, but where the old machines were hackable, the new ones are using IoT embedded devices. Cloud platforms are making the voting process more efficient and their votes are actually being authenticated. So emerging technology is helping us making gains in democracy, but it's also helping us to save lives. Um, and I'd like to take big data tools as an example. Before I turn to the next page, I just wanted to give an overview here. So I mentioned um, energy, nuclear, and commercial facilities as being impacted when we're seeing these um, cyber attacks. Um, picture on the right was uh, a few days ago after the uh, attack on the Colonial uh, Pipeline, long lines there in North Carolina where people lined up uh, to, to pump gas over a thousand gas stations out of gas in the wake of what happened. Um, so, so how is emerging technology helping us um, when we're thinking about some of these threats? I want to talk about big data for a second. Big data from sources like Google and Facebook are being used to create facial recognition algorithms. So facial recognition technology can stop a terrorist attack, you know, in places like the Middle East or be used to find criminals on an inner city street. A lot of different countries like Russia, the US, China, India, United Kingdom, they've all developed real-time facial recognition technology. In, in China, customers even use it to pay um, in Paris, the professors use it to see if students are actually paying attention. Now, I wouldn't do that in one of my classes, but this is an area that's largely unregulated, right? Right now, um, it can be used almost anywhere. So that makes me ask questions like, could criminals use this to target innocent people? Or could innocent people be um, incarcerated based on, for example, algorithms that have been biased against people of color or based on their socioeconomic status. On the positive side, though, we're finding ways to create cures for diseases through harnessing big data and finding patterns that help us know sooner when someone's likely to have a disease like cancer and to start treatments earlier. So we can find patterns in big data sets from past crimes and attacks and then couple it with live data to predict when crimes and violent conflicts or even terrorist attacks can occur. Um, and then we add on top of that AI and machine learning and that can help us sift through these huge data sets and more quickly understand correlation. So large data sets coupled with predictive analytics tools can help doctors track what medicines and um, other aspects are successful in treating illnesses. And they can look at how preconditions link to the development of some diseases or what environmental factors impact change in health status. So emerging technology has vast capabilities to positively change the face of the planet. At the same time, actors across the globe are ready to take advantage of undiscovered weaknesses to create global insecurity. We're faced with how to use these technologies ethically and securely, but our decisions have the potential to build stronger communities and international security or its opposite. That's all I'll say on my topic. I want to turn now to Vitas. Um, my colleague Vitas is going to talk to us more about cybersecurity and critical infrastructure in particular. Vitas has been working in information technology and security policy for over 30 years. He actually worked as a computer specialist for Prince William County government in Virginia. So I uh, did have some early experiences uh, in the US 
And later, he worked as the director of the Ministry of Defense Policy and Planning Department for Lithuania and the Communications and Information System Service. In November of 2016, he was actually delegated by the Minister of National Defense to work as a cybersecurity subject matter expert for the NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence in Vilnius. And he completed a two-year cyber risk study of the industrial control systems used in the NATO Center um, Europe, Europe pipeline system. He's been published in a lot of different reports, among them NATO, uh, the, the OSCE, EU, and ANISA have published reports that were written by him. And we are especially grateful that in 2020, he was redelegated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, in Lithuania to continue his service as a national representative for industrial cybersecurity at the NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence, because that is where I found him and he gladly agreed to join our NATO Science and Technology Project. I've been forever grateful for that. And he's been an invaluable uh, source in sharing his expertise. So I'm going to stop sharing here um, and turn it over to Vitas. Thanks. Hey. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Sarah, and thank you to the Jackson School and University of Washington for this invitation to speak and work with this esteemed panel of colleagues. Let's see if I can get my screen to come up. Okay, can you see my screen? Can someone give me some feedback? Looks yeah. great. Okay. And all right, tell me if it doesn't advance after I go over my title slide. Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about understanding critical infrastructure protection in the post Stuxnet world. Some of you might remember at the end of World War II, Hiroshima was an event that changed military thinking about warfare. I, I always think that the, the Stuxnet operation in 2010 uh, changed cyberspace forever and critical infrastructure. Can you see my next slide? Yes. On settling trends, uh, we just finished a decade uh, since Stuxnet from 2010 to 2020, and I thought it would be a, a nice time to go over uh, some of the important uh, trends, unsettling ones that have gone on in cyberspace that we've all witnessed and uh, lived through. One thing is a big change was uh, with Stuxnet, the technologies behind critical infrastructure became targets. Uh, when I started working, we were worried about protecting databases at ministries and government data centers. Uh, and here there are going uh, after the electricity that makes those data centers run, make the computers run. And uh, these are now targets. What we also see are the machines are given much more autonomy. Uh, humans are taking more of a passive role. With the digitalization that's going on in the energy sector, you don't have linemen going down the line, checking the lines. We have one guy in a control room looking at a big screen with the national power grid. So there's a lot of information technology and telecommunications and, and a lot of wonderful things going on to make that happen. But things can also go wrong. Uh, when the machines uh, take control and can the humans still uh, uh, change something to bring things back to normal? We saw with the Boeing 737 uh, MAX uh, crashes, you had a bad sensor sending bad data to an automated uh, flight control system on the plane. It overrode the commands of the pilot and uh, was responsible for two plane crashes with full loss of life, passengers, and, and, and crew. So this is what we have to uh, think about is we're talking about Industry 4.0, Industrial Internet of Things, putting out a lot of sensors uh, to give us the data and you know sensors by the way at that level are no cybersecurity uh, features on them at all if you break into the network it's game over we also have various approaches to dealing with the problems of cybersecurity the IT office window centric uh, information data uh, emphasis uh, cybersecurity approaches is, are not enough uh, they're okay in the office, but you know, as, as the uh, Hatch nuclear plant reactor shutdown showed a few years ago in the United States, when an IT security guy got a job working for a nuclear power plant, 
he saw a Windows computer did not have its patches and he decided to patch it. It's a great IT security practice, but he didn't have the engineering knowledge of a nuclear power reacting uh, reactor coolant si uh, system, uh, which this computer was connected to. And during the update, uh, the safety system smelled the red and uh, uh, issued an automatic scram reaction to shut down the reactor for 48 hours. That's what happens when you have an IT guy going into an industrial sector who doesn't know what he's looking at. Then we also saw in 2017, the appearance of ransomware as a weapon of mass disruption. We're all talking about the colonial pipeline incident where ransomware called mass disruption, but we saw this in 2017 uh, with the accounting program used by the Ukrainian government uh, tax inspectorate, uh, not Pentia ransomware, uh, uh, caused havoc not only in, in Ukraine, but with like a scatter load shotgun blast went over the world. It hit a uh, shipping company, uh, uh, Maersk uh, shipping lines, hit the port of Baltimore, caused Maersk $300 million in, in damages from a, uh, and they were not the target. There was just, you know, a ransomware. And then the group that put out the ransomware, uh, we all saw through it. This is a, a Russian a, a, a state-run group acting like a cybercrime gang because the ransomware module didn't even work. If the victim wanted to pay the ransom, that part didn't work. They just wanted to disrupt. And while all this is going on, you know, this, we have the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Department of States of, of the world, cyber diplomats and the law enforcement, they have failed terribly. I'm putting my hand in the hornet's nest here, I realize but I'm at the point in my life when I can do that, I guess. Uh, they have failed in terms of state advanced persistent threat actors. It's gone down over the years, it used to be Ministry of Economy, uh, uh, Ministry of Interior. Uh, now it's being given to the military because even law enforcement, when they run into evidence of state actors in an investigation, they drop the case. I have quotes from the head of Interpol and Europol conf uh, confirming this. It's being given to the military to solve. And unfortunately, the military only have one solution to a problem, being a military people. And this is a big failure in the, in the cyber diplomacy of the world. I'll talk about that later. And in spite of all the measures taken, the office IT centric security measures and everything else, the asset owners and solution providers are still surprised when it happens. Even FireEye had its uh, attack tool, penetration testing tool stolen. They advised companies on how to protect themselves against uh, cyber attacks. They were hit with the uh, uh, Orion Solar Winds, you know, a supply chain attack, the solution providers. That lots of havoc is going on. Why is this happening? Well, there's uh, uh, three basic security policy questions that need to be answered if you want to come up with a uh, protection policy. First, you determine what needs to be, to be protected, what are the threats, and how to protect identified assets from identified threats in the most effective way. If you make a mistake in the first question, it carries on over to the other ones. It's a three little pigs children's story. Of the three little pigs, only one of the three little pigs answered the questions correctly. It took into account the wind and the rain, but also remembered there's a wolf out there to look after. And this is a mistake that is being made in many of our uh, strategies and policies is we're, we're forgetting to take the extra step to think like the third little pig. International, all right. In, uh, <laughs> in 2012 at the uh, OSCE in, in Vienna, Lithuania was the, uh, had the presidency of the OSCE in 2012. I co-chaired along with the US government uh, representative, co-chaired the first ad hoc meeting uh, session at the OSCE on, uh, on cybersecurity uh, competence and, and security building measures for states to uh, follow in cyberspace. And I was pretty concerned about the Stuxnet and, and about the Saudi Aramco attack in 2012. And, uh, and I, I came up with three proposals as the head of my delegation countries. Uh, one, states in peacetime stay out of a neighbor's uh, critical infrastructure. Two, states need to act on malicious cyber originating from their space. And to make it stick, to create a monitoring and reporting organization uh, modeled after, for example, the Organization for the uh, 
prohibition of chemical weapons use to monitor and report on violations. These were radical proposals in 2012 and, and uh, the cyber superpower representatives in the room uh, who are all you know, diplomats, not one engineer in the room uh, who could understand what I was trying to say about Stuxnet, uh, they didn't like this at all. But now, you know, I, I noticed today in the, in the uh, news, the ZDNet talked about the UK Minister of Foreign Affairs calling that Russia must do more to tackle cyber criminals operating from within its borders. Okay, that's the uh, proposal number two. States ha have to take responsibility for acting on malicious cyber in their cyber jurisdictions. And we also have the uh, organization for the prohibition on chemical weapons, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the United Nations has also come up with a proposal uh, in their, uh, one of their work groups calling for states in peacetime to stay out of a neighbor's critical infrastructure. So it's been 11 years and I finally I can see the light of day this is happening, but unfortunately, this is still not, this is still a long way to go. What is missing in all these meetings that I have been on cybersecurity strategy, national, local, NATO, European Union, OSCE, you name it, there never was an engineer in the room. And there was never this extra bit of imagination to talk about the critical infrastructure. What is it really? Okay, what is it really? Process control system. So, so this is, you know, we need to keep working at this. I think I'm coming close to my end. And uh, I think I'm in, the, in my time frame here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I will uh, uh, release the screen here. Ready? Yeah, that's my, let's see, let me get my, okay. Come on, I can't get the mouse to go there. Oh, where is this thing properly? And stop sharing. Okay, I'm sorry for the mix up. No worries. Thank you, Vitas. Great job. Um, so I'd like to, so if you put, yeah, fantastic. Uh, Christina Libby is our next speaker, and I'm so glad to introduce a friend and a colleague. She is the Chief Science Officer of Hypergiant, which is the fastest growing AI tech company in America. And she's taught at NYU, as well as the University of Florida, and previously worked for Microsoft, and also as the USAID Communications Officer overseeing all of their communications externally. I want to mention at this point, if I'm allowed, um, that she's also helped found COVID Tech last year, which helps connect critically ill COVID-19 patients with their families by donating smart devices to hospitals and care facilities, which I think is a really cool project. Christina, thank you so much for being here to do a deep dive into AI and what this means for international security. Apologies, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a, really a privilege to be having this conversation. Um, I think I will serve as a, a bit of an interesting um, sort of bridge as we open up to the Q&A section in large part, because um, I kind of want to frame this around a little bit where I'm worried from an AI perspective. And um, let me just share my screen here about where I'm worried and sort of what I think I would love all of you to know and um, and start to, to really kind of push us into a conversation about ideas of, of where do we go from here. So what really worries me, um, technologists are incredibly powerful in our community. And I really believe that we have ceded a lot of our power to technology companies um, and, and sort of allowed them to drive an agenda about society and culture. Um, the problem with sort of technologists telling us what our future should look like is that sort of the enmeshed beliefs in technology, then um, they start to filter out in a variety of different ways. And I think this gets a lot worse as we think about um, stronger technology, as we think about sort of rapid advancements, particularly around sort of my area of knowledge is artificial intelligence. And so as we're thinking about this, should we have technologists 
be making these decisions, be sort of directing how we should be thinking about our society? And, and the answer I want to, to offer is no. So technology companies have a goal, right? They want to make money and they're not well equipped to be thinking about protecting the American people or sort of promoting a better vision of society. And because of that, I don't think they should be sort of endowed with deciding the future that we want to take. Um, there's a sort of this wonderful way of framing it or sort of thinking about it, which is that in the 20th century, we were really interested in this conversation between um, state and collective and sort of how the market should work. And what the role we have to take now is deciding to what extent should our lives be directed and controlled by the digital systems um, that we are building and on what terms. And I think that's really where this conversation plays is, is what are the terms that we want to um, sort of exist in as a nation? And then and how, what does that mean about what technology should be developed, what technology we should use in situations of national security? Um, and, and when to sort of a point of view test made, like when is it okay to be in someone's critical infrastructure? When is it not? We sort of need to start to set norms for that conversation set. Um, and so, well, what is it that AI is going to do? How should we think about it? I think the big concern we have is this idea that will artificial intelligence replace humans? And what does that look like? What is artificial intelligence? So our, our giant concern is that, or sort of idea that we're marching towards is that artificial intelligence will be as smart as or smarter than humans. And the timeline for this varies all over the place, but Kurzweil has made this prediction that in 1945, oh, sorry, 2045, um, that computers will be as smart or smarter than humans. Will they be sentient? Will they have um, feelings and emotions? There's a huge amount of debate around that, what that looks like, sort of the difference between the scientific discussion of um, how we are progressing, what we want to use AI for, and the science fiction, which is much more sort of popular in, in modern conversation. So think about artificial intelligence as what we are trying to do is create systems that can mimic cognitive functions, right? Thinking about cognitive functions as ability. And that in the future, what this can help us with is prediction, planning, solution finding, often finding patterns or ideas that maybe our own bias or our own um, kind of preconceived notions, which is basically the same as bias, will help us to do right? And, um, or sort of can't do, right? Our own bias is standing in the way of having us sort of think about things like um, maybe the type of coffee that someone likes actually can predict sort of um, a, a, a move you make or a location that you live or the city block you live on, right? We're not necessarily drawing those correlatives, but um, maybe when we have sort of enough data on enough things, we can like a computers are able to start to make those levels of predictions. So this is sort of where we're going. The real, I think, way for us to start to think about it now is that we are seeing um, what we're calling like AI human teaming or bot human teaming, which is when it's sort of how do we use the cognitive functions of machines in order to help humans better do their jobs? Does that end up in a dystopian nightmare? TBD? Hopefully not. And I think the reason for it not is is it for us to sort of get a better understanding of what is happening. Because right now, what we're seeing is that many of our biggest threats are actually worsening with artificial intelligence. And part of that is because artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, that is increasing the speed with which actions can happen, but also the severity and the scale. And so it's sort of removing human decision makers in a lot of functions, um, but also we are not sort of prepared to respond to so many different threats in so many different ways. So, you know, in 2020, um, we saw 1,001 cases of data breaches against the U.S. government. That's sort of a massive onslaught, and we're not necessarily prepared to respond with the appropriate systems or um, the appropriate, even sort of having enough people with enough knowledge to make enough smart decisions about that level of attack. So what we're seeing is sort of this rising, um, rising set of concerns. And, and the problem is that we don't really have enough people who are sort of educated to 
understand what these terms mean. So things that we need to start to think about are that advances in AI will impact our military superiority, our information superiority, and our economic superiority. And right now we are weak in both defensive and offensive scenarios, um, looking at sort of the growing complexity of attacks, the scope of those opportunities. And that's because there is so much to learn, right? I sort of made this list on the side of just kind of like a top, you know, a top list of terms about artificial intelligence. And it's really complicated unless you dive in. So we have to start to make sure that our politicians, our decision makers, and just our general public are aware of things like human machine learn, um, human machine teaming, what deep fakes are, um, thinking about robotic automation processing, all of these sort of um, terms that require us to actually like dig into the technology and and just sort of the original point is we can't let this sit in the hands of technologists alone. We also have to become invested in what these terms mean um, for our future. And so what can what can be done? What what can we do to sort of fix the fact that as AI becomes more prevalent, it is increasing sort of the scale and threats um, to our society. At the same time, our political figures are not necessarily as educated on the topics as we need to be in order for them to kind of counterbalance the fast pacing drive of technologists. Like what are some things we can start to think about? So um, some of these ideas involve doing things like bringing back the Office of Technical Assessment. I think right now at sort of a senior decision-making level, um, but all the way down, we don't really have the skills in our political figures to, um, to understand what's happening because it's so complicated. So a sort of little story about this is I went to Capitol Hill, I think last a year or two years ago to meet with the, um, the AI caucus um, at the Senate. So it's being, it's a bi bipartisan commission and the junior staffer leading the, all of this work, um, he has a degree in forestry. And so he had, had sort of been there for six months, like trying to rev up as much as he could to learn about technology, but obviously, you know, still not an expert. And he felt very much like he didn't have the resources or the technology to truly understand the complexity of what's happening because so many people don't understand the complexity. And so, um, so one of the big things is bringing back the Office of Technical Assessment in 1994, that office um, was uh, dissolved. Um, and its sole purpose was to sort of educate political decision makers on what is happening um, from a technical perspective. Um, the, uh, the EU does a great job and sort of NATO is doing a really great job on creating education and sort of centers of excellence around this, which is also a great way for the US, uh, direction for the US to think about it. And I think a lot of kudos for sort of other, other parties. Um, we also need to think about hiring more technical advisors, um, which is a point that Vitas made as well, making sure that there are engineers and people in the room with political decision makers. Um, also, we need to be working on better detection and offensive capacity, um, particularly thinking about how do we leverage AI to our advantage. Um, and then we also need to think about broad scale education across the populace. Um, most people don't understand artificial intelligence, don't know what it means, and so also can't sort of lobby for um, creating advancements in sort of our political awareness. And then we don't talk about this very much, but coming from the private sector, and then I'm really gonna end on this point because I think it's so important is finding more innovative ways to fund um, to fund startups. Um, because so much of this work is very expensive. It's research heavy and intensive, um, and it doesn't really contribute. It's, it's hard for there to be sort of the immediate return for venture capital. And so we need to think about as a government how do we how do we fund more things, but also potentially in ways that are lucrative to us, where the government can act as sort of a venture backed um, venture backing for startups um, in that way to sort of increase our our capacities um, as nations. And and again, the EU um, is really starting to do a great job about doing this and increasing their spending in startup um, into startup capacities. So I think we have some good models to talk about there as well. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, I love what you said about uh, we as citizens, not just 
scientists being invested in how technology is developing and being secured. Uh, that's something that uh, Ambassador Koenig and I have talked about in our class with our students and just the role that the citizen plays, right? Um, so I think that's something I hope we get to in the discussion a little bit more. I did want to thank you so much for your talk. So I'd, I'd love to turn it over to Ambassador Koenig now. And um, he uh, has the amazing resume also for this panel. Um, he's our moderator this evening, and it's really been my pri privilege to be teaching with him um, this combined class with a fine team of University of Washington and US Army War College fellows. Um, there's lots to learn from him as he spent more than three decades in the US Foreign Service, and his last post was as US Ambassador to Cyprus. He previously served as political advisor to the NATO Joint Forces Command in Naples, Italy, and also served as the Deputy Chief of Mission in Berlin, Germany, and as Deputy Permanent Representative to the US Mission at NATO. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to him. Um, and I'd also like to remind you that uh, at the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, you have the opportunity to send him questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, let me just uh, say that it's been a great pleasure to work with you. It's a real opportunity for me as a person who worked in NATO uh, a little bit in the past to deal with, to learn from you and to participate with you in learning about what is really one of the most interesting challenges facing the, the, the global community, the uh, transatlantic community, and the United States today. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you also to uh, Lila Fernandez and the Jackson School for uh, bringing me on board after I left uh, the Foreign Service in 2015. And thank you to our two other speakers, uh, Christina and Vitas, for excellent presentations, as well as yours, Sarah. I'm going to... Uh, Remind everyone that if you have a question, please do post it in the Q&A. I will uh, uh, have the job of curating the questions and, and uh, giving them to our panelists. And I'm going to start since we only have two so far and I would encourage you to add more. I'm gonna start with a question of my own because it's very, very timely. Vitas, we're lucky, uh, particularly lucky to have Vitas with us today because uh, the uh, colonial pipeline uh, incident or attack is, is so much uh, on our minds and we're still actually living with the consequences of it and we might be for some time. Uh, Vitas has done quite a bit of work in this field uh, with regard to Europe and a, a rather a little known uh, pipeline system that is operated by NATO on the European continent, but also more broadly as a as an issue related to the security of infrastructure in this new cyber environment. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Vitas with a question. Basically, what are your thoughts about this more broadly? How does it show our vulnerabilities and are there solutions uh, in, that you can see for an attack like the one against Continental Pipeline? Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much, Ambassador. Uh, the NATO Central European Pipeline System that I did my cyber risk study uh, is a four country, uh, 5,000 kilometer long pipeline from uh, Marseille to Rotterdam. It serves, uh, Frankfurt Airport, uh, Shiapal uh, and Ramstein uh, military and other airports in, in, those, in those four countries. So I, I, I was really haunted by the reports of the Colonial Pipeline because in November of 2019, I gave my report findings and recommendations to NATO headquarters in Brussels uh, three months before the United States CISA issued their report to their pipeline operators in uh, February of 2020. So, so uh, these are some uh, initial observations and, and thoughts and, and some suggestions for the way ahead on this uh, incident, which has really dominated uh, some of the headlines. Well, uh, what happened? Well, the office IT of the company, you know, where the billing and accounting, you know, who buys the oil, who sells it, uh, where is it going, what time, what ship, uh, and so forth, what depot, was hit with a ransomware. But the physical operations of the pipeline, the industrial control systems, uh, they were not affected. It didn't carry over, although we'll find out for sure after the investigation is, is held, and I hope there's some findings uh, published in the public. But those operations were not affected. However, you know, we saw a big surprise was that the, uh, when the IT side went down, they had all the data, all the billing and accounting data, 
And the pipeline operators didn't know what to do with the oil that was pumping down. You know, you have a water hammer effects if, if you know, if you try to stop the oil and, and, you know, they had no choice but to shut it down because they didn't know what, what to do with the oil. There was, you know, 2.5 million barrels a day. So, so that was a big surprise. And uh, a, a Russian uh, a cybercrime gang uh, uh, felt remorse. They issued a statement saying, gee, we're really sorry. Uh, we didn't realize this was going to hurt somebody. We didn't want to do that. And we'll be more careful in the future. Really nice uh, statement from a cyber criminal. And, and you know, uh, I'm still not convinced if these are cyber crimes. You know, we had the, uh, when the US government's uh, cyber, cyber uh, tools were stolen a few years back in 2017, we had this guy called Guccifer who was selling uh, these tools and he was saying, I'm, you know, I'm a lone wolf, but everybody figured out he was uh, you know, working for a government. So he was acting like a cybercrime guy, but he was a, a government guy, most likely. So what are some takeaways? Well, for example, we have new vulnerabilities showing, you know, there's a price to pay from integrating information technology, operational technology, the industrial internet of things, the cloud, putting things in the cloud. These can have an effect. And, and a, a big surprise was we thought only states can do this. Only the states have the cyber 007s that have the, uh, the cues for the resources and the, and the technology and the resources and the patients to do this. Now we see, a, 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 if it's true, a cyber crime gang that's less skilled can give disruption where and, and to uh, paralyze a uh, national asset of a country. Another takeaway is the IT and the OT teams, they can't work in separate silos anymore. They need to realize they need each other. The office IT and accounting need to realize that they uh, have to understand the physical process, the laws of physics and chemistry that go on on the operational technology side. They need to sit down together. As a matter of fact, Colonial yesterday uh, issued a help wanted. They're looking for a cybersecurity manager. If I was to give him advice, I would tell him, get an office close to the operational side, get a, a, a big pot of uh, coffee, an espresso coffee machine maker, and a, a, a week supply of donuts and start talking to your engineers and, uh, and come up with ways, a contingency plan, so this will not happen again. Exercise to test it and to create an industrial cybersecurity operations center for the industrial side on what's, on, what's behind the firewall where it's a mistake to think you're safe now. Uh, you're no longer safe. And uh, the last big takeaway is if you're an operator of a strategic asset of your nation, you should consider yourself a target. You can no longer hide behind security by obscurity. If you are a national asset, an adversary is going to seek to paralyze your operations because that's going to fit in with their offensive ends if, uh, if, if, if a conference uh, uh, a conflict ever took place. And again, engineers, don't forget to bring them in. Okay, thank you. I hope I, hope I answered at least partially your question. Thank you very much, Vidas, you did, absolutely. We've gotten quite a few excellent questions and I'm going to sort of summarize a couple of them and package them to present to our panelists. Um, first, uh, there are several that deal with AI and that was also an area that I wanted to ask about. So I'm gonna ask about two different aspects of AI that have come up quite a bit in the uh, Q&A. Uh, the first is, and I shared this uh, question with my colleague, Maria Cartogli, who uh, was a co-teacher with me in, uh, in Rome last year uh, and who I admire and I'm very happy to see on this uh, uh, group um, is the China angle. What special challenges do we face with China? Uh, especially in the context, uh, Christina, that you presented some of the issues, funding for startups, a purpose, a national policy in AI, uh, China seems to present special challenges. And then the second is more has more to do with the ethics of how we allow um, AI to develop uh, the question of, do we want uh, AI systems to mimic um, uh, human emotions? Can we control it even? And uh, how, what is the level at which uh, uh, startups can get access to AI? Are we in a kind of drone situation where our adversaries have very inexpensive mechanisms via AI to challenge our uh, security systems, which are relatively uh, resource intensive? 
these are just a few of the questions that have come up on AI, but perhaps we could start there. It seems to have sparked a lot of, of interest. I will start and then I would love to sort of open it up to, to everyone else to comment on. Um, I think the China AI question is particularly important for us to consider, particularly again, sort of an American or I guess broadly a non, anyone who's not China. So China has a very clear plan for how they want to think about artificial intelligence and their path to both artificial and general super intelligence. And they are sort of working against a unified vision for what that means. There's actually sort of this beautiful book called The Big Nine that talks about artificial intelligence and sort of the big nine tech companies and how they work with their respective governments. And then it does some actually great work about scenario building, sort of fictitious um, future visions for what it could look like that talks to this point very well. So I, I highly recommend everyone read that. But the important point I think is that the US doesn't have this artificial intelligence sort of vision in the same way. We are not working with our independent technology companies um, in the same way towards a path to achieve sort of a vision for what we want artificial intelligence to do for our country and our people and our community. And that is not public. But we're, I mean, and there's not sort of like a, a public connection to it, right? And that disparity is a huge disadvantage for us from a military and economic and a social perspective. Um, and, and we need to think about that, right? So what we have now is a bunch of companies that are sort of pushing their own AI agendas in very specific ways. Um, and gosh, could we do it better if we were more connected, if there was a stronger vision? And, and I think that goes sort of back to this like even bigger Uber question, particularly in America, where which is the area I'm sort of best prepared to speak on. But what do we want our society and our community to do? Who do we want to be in the future? What do we want the world to look like? Like these are questions that I think we are struggling to answer in a community perspective. And so you bring up the question of ethics, right? Sort of what, like, what do we want ethically in regards to AI? Do we want it to be sentient? Do we want there to be human AI teaming? Well, how do we know if we don't sort of know where we're going, if we don't have a collective vision of what the future of American society can be like? Um, I think Europe is starting to do a, like a really good job on this and sort of we've talked about this a lot in the NATO project that we're working on um, and doing sort of really seeing there be a coalescing of, of a vision there. Um, but I would say it's a massive disadvantage in the US and we need to really kind of reckon with what what is happening and I think it's a true sort of like failure of long-term thinking that's being driven by the capital structures of technology companies which are focused on quarterly earnings and and we need to start to think about how to make that how to change that if we want to sort of remain a important global power very interesting thank you Sarah or Vitas, would you like to step in on this question? No. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It calls to mind. There are many that... other points of view on the response other than mine, but I think it's a really contentious uh, topic to bring up in, in so many ways, ethically and politically. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with just a bit uh, as a very much of a layman in this, but Bill McGibbon wrote an excellent book called Falter a couple of years ago that kind of delves into this set of quandaries, I would say, about uh, where we go from here, ask more questions than answers, provides answers. Um, there's another set of questions that focuses on a point that, um, that Sarah Lohman raised, and that is, what is the role of citizens? I mean, and these questions range from things like, should I be afraid of my Fitbit? Should I be worried that I am sharing a great deal of uh, information about my personal condition uh, in an uncontrolled space? Uh, to why are not why is it so difficult, and how might we address the question of getting more technologists involved on the side of the sort of public interest, or getting more engineers involved in the government side of looking at the question? Why is this um, imbalance? Uh, that uh, both Christina and Sarah and Vitas, all of you have sent, noted, this imbalance between private sector role in our society and public sector control, I guess you would say, why is it so um, hard to address? 
um, I think uh, any of you would be welcome to take this on. I'd be happy to tackle it. Um, so as you know, John, I'm a huge advocate of uh, the citizen becoming involved. This is affecting every area of our lives. So as we look at emerging technology, it's, you know, when when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we're looking at is our smartphone. We have our um, uh, home assistants. We have every aspect of our day is um, interacting with emerging technology. And so I do think we need to have a voice from the beginning on in terms of how these are being developed and how they're being regulated. Um, and I don't think there's a reason that we should feel powerless. Why is that? Even if we're not an engineer, even if we are not a regulator, we do have a voice in this society. And it's been an amazing privilege to be part of the UW faculty experience because there are so many people there that are involved in raising their voice. And that's been a real um, role model experience for me. So let's just take the issue of surveillance. Somebody in the um, Q&A did ask a question about surveillance. Um, so uh, there, there was, over in the law department, there was an expert, um, Jevin Hudson, who I was able to interact with about a year and a half ago when I was still in the um, Com Lead program. And he uh, spoke with us about what was going on in surveillance. And I had the opportunity to go over to Olympia shortly after that happened. And he was frequently over in Olympia. And um, a lot of what was happening with uh, surveillance in Washington state and even in the Seattle area around, for example, the Black Lives Matter protests, um, we raised our voices about what was going on with uh, surveillance and how we saw surveillance developing, how we how we wanted to have it regulated um, and our privacy concerns. And uh, that's something that students can do, that's something professors can do, that's something that any member of, of society can do. And we can uh, let our regulators, our, our legislators know how we feel about these issues, how we want this technology um, to, to look to be regulated to ensure that our privacy rights are not violated. So that's, that's one in answering the one question, but I do firmly believe that every citizen and even civil society has a strong role to play in this process. That means that we, when we're developing technology, when the government is developing regulations, that we have civil society around the table, that we also have the tech companies around the table. One thing that we've seen quite frequently happen is that governments come in and they tell technology companies what needs to happen, what backdoors need to be put in so that citizens aren't sure about their own rights. Um, the technology companies are being told after the fact how they need to change their technology. What if we have the technology companies there on the front end? What if we have citizens around the table on the front end to say, these are our rights. We wanna make sure that how the technology develops is respecting those. Um, and so what we've seen is these um, ground roots movements. And what we saw a couple of years ago were, were things like the Paris call that joined um, 180 some governments around the world, plus um, hundreds of NGOs and a number of universities and all kinds of um, tech companies coming together to say, we're going to keep each other accountable. We're going to make sure that we're not using cyber warfare in a way that harms civilians. We're gonna make sure that technology is developed in a way that is not um, violating privacy and a number of other things. Um, but that's just one effort to get civil society more involved. There are many, many others. And I do believe that not just the University of Washington, but citizens anywhere can get involved. Thank you, Sarah. That was excellent. Um, if it's all right, I'd like to move on to a next set of questions. Um, I'd like to draw a bit on uh, what Vitas said because his comments um, on a certain topic, I think, uh, feed into a number of questions that uh, have come in on the Q&A. Uh, one of them was raised by Zabina Lang, another colleague at JSIS, who is in a way my boss in many cases. Um, uh, and it's been great to work with her. Uh, but there are, there are several that relate to each other. Um, one is, what is the role of NATO? And particularly, how do you address uh, the question of a response to a malicious attack that might come from a state actor? Um, this is a huge challenge, I understand. The second is, what about the EU? And this is the one from Zabina. 
uh, I think it was Sarah who mentioned, the, or it was Vitas perhaps, who said that there is an improvement in um, the uh, funding arrangements of, uh, for startups and uh, security related aspects of development of uh, these uh, cutting edge technologies in the European Union, if you could describe that a little more. And then if I can broaden the question at the end, um, as particularly in the direction that Vitas developed it, how, what is the, what is the, uh, what are the prospects for getting a broad-based state-supported uh, management of cyber crime and cyber threats uh, in, in through international agreements? These, we've been working on this for a decade, and we've gotten almost nowhere. What are the prospects for truly inclusive um, approaches to this? Let's say at the UN level. What are the prospects at a lower level OSCE, perhaps, or OECD, or one of the G's, G7, G20, anything like that. Where do we where do we locate this work in order for it to be most effective, or is the answer all of the above? Uh, okay, I can take a stab at it. Well, I, I'm not too worried about uh, the efforts made for cybercrime. You have the uh, the uh, uh, Council's uh, Cybercrime Convention. You watch the news; uh, they're catching cyber criminals. I mean the. Uh, He'll attack the United States, but the law enforcement of Europe will capture him in Spain and take him for, for trial. They're, they're sending botnets down. Where the, the most dangerous activity, which is completely unregulated, you know, I, all these uh, uh, state APT attacks, you know, I, I'm, I'm really uh, reading some articles, commentary about the Solar Winds Orion. They said, Oh, that's, that's espionage. You know, we live with it since the time of Mata Hari. It's espionage. You know, this really bothers me. It's a dangerous way to think of this because in cyber espionage, the difference between a cyber espionage spy who's stealing your data and a cyber a saboteur who's destroying your equipment is only evident after he or she presses the enter key. Once you break into a system, you're in. You can steal data if you like, or you can disrupt and destroy. So this is something that, that really has to be uh, uh, understood. And as far as what uh, states can do, you know, they better stop talking that, oh, this is all right. This is cyber espionage. You know, you're pushing the limits here. I, I made the point that, you know, 11 years ago, ministries of communications and informatics would handle cybersecurity for a country. It's gone through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now it's gone to the military. Okay, so this uh, peaceful discussion is less likely to happen. Now you're going to, you're talking about forward defense. You're talking about countries coming up with cyber commands. What are they doing, these cyber commands? Are they sitting around eating coffee and donuts? <laughs> I think they're very, very active. Even, you know, you go back to what Snowden was talking about. We'll give you an idea what governments are, aren't doing, not just the government that he was talking about. There's a whole group, you know, as the old Irish saying, is this a private fight or can anybody else get into it? I mean, there, there's a, this is an activity that is cheap effective and deniable, and it's a nice way for a frustrated country to reach a foreign policy objective that they can't get through the UN or, or some other means. What can NATO do? You know, NATO doesn't represent the world. It's like, what, 28 countries? China's not in NATO. That's a billion internet users. You know, I, I once uh, attended a, a conference for a, a security institution. They wanted to talk about uh, uh, developing a cybersecurity program. And the issue came up, should we invite the Chinese? And you know, they said, no. And I raised my hand, wait a minute, you wanna talk about cybersecurity education and training, you gotta invite them anyway, because they represent over a billion internet users. The Talon manual that's going through its third version right now, you might've heard about that. It went, you know, I've criticized it all over the place. There's no engineers writing that ma manual, it's lawyers. And you know, when the law always comes behind cyber, when the, when the uh, automobile came out in the first days, there were no traffic lights or any kind of laws. You know, they bumped into cows and people and everything else. And then the law came out after the technology was on our streets. You know, this is, this is something that, that has to be looked at. So, so and, and, and then I wanna comment about the role of the citizens. 
Citizens, if there is an attack on your country's critical infrastructure, you are going to suffer the most. So you have the most interest. If you lose your power grid for a week, you have one flush left in your toilet and the food that's left in your refrigerator for a couple hours. So you should be raising your hand, demanding from your government, stop playing these games with other countries' critical infrastructure. Don't get them excited. Talk about what's common. You know, if, if you attack the financial system of the United States, the guy who's attacked is going to feel it on his credit card because it's so interrelated. We're all sitting on the branch of the same tree. Okay, for now. Excellent, Vitas. Um, anyone else want to come in at this point? I have other questions I was going to post, but uh, Christina or Sarah? Good. Why don't we move on to the next bunch of questions or the next kind of question? And um, that is basically, um, th I've really enjoyed these presentations in part because they, they kind of tie what is sometimes considered a highly technology-oriented issue or a kind of techie issue to real-life questions about how we organize uh, ourselves as a society. And we've gotten a range of questions that kind of come at this from two different angles. One is um, the angle that says, are, how do we make decisions about this? I know that we've already, already posed this question, but are, is this a time coming out of the pandemic at a time when people have perhaps seen an acceleration of these challenges? Is this a time for us to reconsider in a broad way how we address them and maybe try to make a fresh start? So that's one side of the question. The other side of the question is, in, in light of the capacity of quantum computing and the, vast, the rapidly increasing sophistication of AI and maybe the autonomy, genuine autonomy of AI, have we already lost this? Is this a battle which we have already lost, the fundamental societal battle of how technology fits in our lives? That's tough. I hope that the answer is going to be more on the former, that we can change things, but uh, Perhaps I could direct this one initially to Christina. You're working mostly on AI. Yeah, I can start here. Um, I think apathy is our greatest weakness as a society, right? Like when we give up and we think we can't do anything, then we have already lost, right? And I think um, there's a lot we've already lost, right? Uh, personal digital privacy kind of out the door in a lot of ways, particularly in the US. Um, can we get that back? I don't know. Can we have a more concerted response to emerging technologies to ensure that they are in service of us and not used against us? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, one of the things that Vitas said very well was that you, citizens are the victims of the majority of cyber attacks. And a huge number of cyber attacks are perpetrated against corporations and the victims of corporations are citizens, right? The fact that there are, um, you know, low level sort of cyber skirmishes happening between either cyber criminals or cyber criminals as fronts for governments um, every day, sort of all over the world feels like we are all engaged in this sort of warm war that we know nothing about. Um, if this war was kinetic, if instead of launching cyber attacks all of the time, there were a lot of more, um, you know, bullets and uh, sort of other kinds of physical weapons being used, then we wouldn't sit back so quietly because we would be able to see it. And so I think the challenge for um, leaders, the challenge for communities who want to activate against this is, is how do we visualize this problem to citizens to generate awareness? Um, I co-host this Breakfast with New America that happens every so often. And that's one of the things that we really have sort of coalesced around the need to find ways to visualize cyber threats in order to sort of galvanize the citizen into action. Because I think um, we may have lost what we've lost, but we haven't lost everything. And to give up and just assume that we can't make progress feels like um, sort of the end of a democratic society, right? Like, like what? Like, if when we no longer care, then what? What are we doing? So, um, that's my very pointed, pointed thoughts. I, I welcome others. Sarah or Vita? Pandemic. Yeah, I can speak to the pandemic uh, prioritization. I do think that we've seen shifts um, since the pandemic 
in making this more of a focus. Um, let's face it, we were all forced to be at home, be in home office. Our kids were in front of the screen the whole day. Um, we became aware through the major uh, cyber hacks this year, like the um, Hafnium hack that um, actually caused a ransomware attack that forced public schools to cancel classes, um, as well as the others that, that I mentioned today. Um, this makes us aware of our vulnerabilities, but also aware of all the opportunities. And so while if this pandemic had happened decades ago, we wouldn't have had the ability to continue working online or to put school online. We now have that availability, but we've also seen how vulnerable we are and how far we have to go in uh, ensuring that we are secure. Um, you have seen, so so Biden, obviously the, the presidential proclamation just in the last few hours, um, allowing funds to be used and a huge focus on cybersecurity uh, prevention um, and, and to ensure that, uh, sorry, cybersecurity attacks um, and to prevent future disasters on critical infrastructure, making sure that this is a priority um, for the US government. And so you've seen this response, you've seen it bec become front and center, um, both here in Europe where I'm sitting, but also in uh, the United States over the last year. And I think we're just gonna see that increase because it is so very important. And we're now seeing how civil society is so closely linked to everything that happens. Great, thanks, Vitas. Well, you know, I think we've all had a chance during this uh, epidemic to think as human beings and to think about what's really important in life. I myself had to fight a crow that was attacking my fiber optic cable that was going to threaten my daughter's and son's uh, ability to do remote schooling and for my wife uh, when she was in quarantine to run her clinic. I uh, was pecking at the fiber optic cable came that much from being disconnected from the world. Uh, so, so you know, and I still think we have time to manage this issue. This is what we're here for. This is our task. And I really think during this pandemic, the uh, people who work behind the scenes every day to make sure the lights go on and the water to come out uh, and, and, and the fuel to come down the line into our automobiles, they need a big word of thanks because I think they did not suffer any less as a group of people and they kept the civilization, you know, the, the, the well-being of society up and running. They should be giving a, a big word of thanks uh, to all those unsung engineers. And, and I, I hope that they uh, are given a, a chance at the table when these programs and these problems are being uh, searched for and discussed. Thank you, Vitas. Thanks, all of you. This will probably be the last question. It's kind of uh, de uh, develops this idea further and in a direction that I think some of the questioners have wanted to go. Um, a couple of people sort of asked, um, doesn't this issue, I mean, uh, of course, encouraging civil society to be engaged and individual citizens to become engaged is, is extremely important. But it does sort of bring us to the question of who actually uh, uh, has a voice and who actually has power in, in our societies, not only the United States, but others. And uh, there's much talk about cooperating with uh, tech giants like Amazon and uh, Google and or Alphabet and Microsoft and so forth. But I think many people have a rather jaded view of this uh, in, in the American political system, that in fact money talks and uh, that in fact the voice of citizens is, is somewhat diminished. Uh, so I guess what I would ask is, how does this sort out? How do you balance the private sector interest with the public sector, sector interest? And uh, I want you to, sh to demonstrate to me as a somewhat jaded citizen that uh, money doesn't really talk in this field. Um, having watched the hearings involving the AI giants I, or the uh, tech giants, I sometimes wonder myself. So that's directed to anyone okay. who wants to take on that hot potato, who wants to pick it up. <laughs> I, I, I will take uh, this on a little bit. Um, popular opinion, right, has made it so that technology companies don't think they have to answer to politicians. And the lack of political education about technology issues has made politicians seem unable to handle the challenges, right? 
this is my point of view. And so technology companies think they are above the law. I also think we have done a huge amount sort of as a society to endow um, technologists, particularly sort of leading figures with almost like godlike characteristics, right? We have created cults around Elon Musk. We have created cults around Jeff Bezos. The problem with that cultification is that then these people think that they are more important than the elected political leaders. The problem that we have then is that they amount sort of massive amounts of money and they feel like they are able to operate outside the law. And so what we need is we need political leaders who are able to understand the complexity of the technology challenges that we are experiencing and respond to that. Now, what that requires is money and a point of view on behalf of society, where I think we actually are seeing a kind of um, a coalescing of funding is private family offices and ultra high net worth individuals who are understanding that we have given too much power to technology companies and realizing that that needs to be pulled in in some way. Um, and so I do believe, and I know that the um, Solarium Commission is going to also continue to recommend things like bringing back the Office of Technology Assessment, doing more work to sort of ensure this balancing of power. And I think it's not unprecedented in America, right? We had a, sort of at the turn of the 19th, of the 20th century, we had, um, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, what are, what were, there was, what's the term for them, sort of all of the railroad bearing. Bust, busting. And, Right, right. We had sort of all of these huge corporations that had an outsized impact that were being able to dictate the future of society. And then we had society sort of like slap back and say, hey, no, we don't actually want you to do that. And so I honestly think we're at um, the early stages of seeing that that change in societal pressure and, and cusp and that we will see sort of younger political figures get into office. We will see older political figures get educated and we will see processes and standards to, to augment that. The last point on this though, is that because of this breakdown, internal employees at technology companies also don't want them to work with the government because they think the government is bad, right? We saw this at Google, we saw this at Microsoft, Amazon. Um, and so the government also needs to sort of do more to create a sense of trust within the technology community that working together is actually beneficial for the population. I think the defense industry tried to do this with the Defense Innovation Board, and I think there has been some success there in terms of setting ethical guidelines and sort of visioning for what technology can do in a security setting. Um, but we need to do more. And I think the point that you made is like, money does talk, but there's other money. Right. And so that's kind of what we need to figure out is how to get that other money on board to act as a balancing force. Others. Thank you very much, Christina, for 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 grasping the nettle. Um, Sarah uh, Vitas, do you want to say uh, anything on this? I'll just say a couple of words. I do think that we saw, for example, what happened with Facebook, that regulation does have a role to play, a regulation of different companies came into play. Um, here in Europe, there was a whole slew of regulations that then came into play after the violation of privacy um, by Facebook in the Cambridge Analytica case. But even beyond that, that started a whole slew of regulation and conversations that happened in the US as well around uh, privacy rights, around the right of the citizen. and. Um, there is a push to keep big tech more accountable. The second thing is that um, I think we as citizens need to have a core, um, and, and this is one thing that I've taught in the past in my emerging technology class, we need to have core tenants. Now we've talked about this in, in ComLead about having core tenants that are um, revolving around equity, around transparency and around community and ensuring that that is something that we're ingrained in the creation of technology, whether we're engineers, whether we're policymakers, or whether we're citizens. This then affects what we consume. It affects how we uh, speak with our legislators and it affects when we're creators, how we innovate with technology. Thank you, Sarah. Vitas? Well, I'm gonna go waxing philosophical here a little bit. You know. 
I always wonder to myself, uh, what are the people going to do about job creation? As we have more and more machines doing the work, maybe some of the menial manual work. Uh, you saw the film, uh, maybe Nomad Land. They showed about these uh, pensioners who lost their finances from the crisis and they're uh, doing uh, warehouse work in Amazon warehouses but there's a robot next to them, uh, pretty much almost ready to take their place. You know, what are people going to do? You know, not everybody is going to go uh, get an engineering degree. Uh, I think unemployment in the US during the, the COVID was, was really approaching very high. When you get close to 25%, uh, Hitler starts to show up in your society, you know, promising things. What are these people going to do? You know, what uh, are they going to get the skills they need? Uh, somebody asked me to review one of their futuristic books, and they basically, you know, I thought it was very far-fetched, but I'm starting to think about it more. He predicted this society, you know, this uh, job problem, and he basically proposed that uh, the machines would do all the work, and everybody would kind of like get an automatic pension. You know, they, they would work when they feel like it, do what they want. They would get a guaranteed pension, and, and they would they would keep them quiet, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, and uh, happy. But uh, there's a real issue of what to work, uh, what work to do. And, and finally, you know, I'm going to give away a lot of stuff. I was born during the administration of President Eisenhower. Now, I can't say I remember, but his farewell speech, he, called about, he talked about uh, the military industrial complex. And we sure are, are <laughs> knee deep or neck deep into that. And, and uh, that's going to be really hard to handle. You know, I've been. Uh, Several times a week, I tell myself I'm going to get out of social media. I'm going to disable my Facebook and my LinkedIn and Twitter. It's, I don't like what it's doing to my brain and to the, the, my children, but it's, I can't do it. You know, I, I want to have it, and, uh, but I know it's not a good thing, and, and it's doing some bad things for society. I have a picture sitting at an airport waiting for a plane, and I see a group of uh, young ladies. Uh, they should be talking to each other, but they're talking to their smartphone. Okay, who, what is friendship in these days? Is it a friend on the Facebook or the friend that's sitting maybe next to you physically, but you're paying attention to the virtual friends? You know, very many uh, social issues, which uh, is going to make a lot of work for us, interesting uh, work for us in the future. Well, th these have been very, very interesting um, responses to a set of very interesting questions uh, following excellent presentations. I think we're about at the point where I should uh, transfer back to uh, Lila Fernandez for some, some concluding remarks. Let me just say thank you from my behalf to, um, to all of you, Sarah, Christina, and Vitas for excellent presentations. And thank you to all the audience members who uh, offered questions. I think it stimulated exactly the kind of discussion that we need to be having about these profound issues that are both uh, technological but also societal and ethical. So thank you very much. And with no further ado, I turn it back to Leela. Uh, thank you so much, John. And thank you for doing such a wonderful job of moderating. Um, I just, I think I will just conclude this event by saying I could not think of a more important um, and rich discussion to end our speaker series with. It was um, fascinating. Um, I think you raised some really, really um, serious and also very troubling questions about how we're gonna shape our future and, and the sort of cross section of um, democratic rights of citizenship, questions of state accountability and governance, um, and then what we're gonna do at the global air, um, arena. And this kind of um, tension I, I felt, which you all brought up really nicely between the need to have states accountable and responsible for activities within their um, uh, uh, sovereign borders, and then the need for international agreements. And part of um, citizen, you know, from as the director of the Jackson School, part of one of the challenges of citizenship in the U United States is getting people to understand why international agreements matter. You know, in terms of not allowing this to devolve into a, a series of um, a slide into proxy warfare through through cyber attacks. And um, so, let me just conclude by just thanking you. This was a truly wonderful um, and enriching panel. And um, um, it was just wonderful to, to have all of you uh, here today. Um, so we're going to uh, disconnect now and I won't get to see you, but um, uh, hope, hopefully we'll have you all here at UW in person at some point. Bye. <laughs>